I'm Batman. Who are you? My name is Bond. Bond. I'm Batman. My name is Bond. James Bond. I'm Batman. Bond. James, James Bond. Bond. I'm Batman. Bond. 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 I'm Batman. Bond. This is the Batman vs. James Bond show. The show covering everything related to Batman and James Bond movies. And now, here's your host, Brian Thomas. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to an all-new episode of the Batman vs. James Bond show. I am your host, Brian Thomas. Thanks for joining me. This is the show where we discuss everything related to Batman and James Bond movies. I uh, hope you had a great week. Welcome back to everybody who has been listening since episode one. You know who you are. And for all you newbies out there, all you Batman vs. James Bond virgins out there, Welcome. Not sure how you found the show, but I'm glad to have you here with me. Um, yeah, this is pretty much a laid back, kind of like a, if you want to call it like a fan cast almost. It's, uh, I'm not a movie critic. I'm not a writer. I'm not a movie website kind of guy. I'm just a guy who's obsessed with Batman and James Bond. It's kind of why I put this together. I just love talking about it. Um, of course, there's more to learn about Batman movies and James Bond movies out there. And, uh, maybe you guys probably know more than I do. And, uh, and that's why I always welcome you. I always put it at the very end of the show. I'm like, if you ever want to talk on this show, I know I'm putting this at the beginning, but if you ever want to talk, you know, come on the show. I welcome that. Anyway, um, yeah, it's been a great week, all things considered. It's been a long extended weekend. And uh, it honestly, I don't know about you guys, um, here in the United States anyway, uh, we were sub- celebrating Memorial Day weekend. And that's where we honor those who've served in the military and given their lives. And, uh, you know, of course, we'll dedicate this episode to them, you know, all the fallen heroes out there. Um, outside of the United States, I hear it's something called Bank Holiday. And I heard saw a hashtag for that. And for the life of me, I have no idea what that is. Um, maybe it's exactly what I, it sounds like. Maybe it's just an excuse for a day off and the banks are closed. I have no idea. So to all you UK or Ireland listeners out there, you know, send me a tweet. Let me know what is Bank Holiday. I'm, I'm dying to know what this is. And, uh, you know, that'd be pretty cool. Anyway, um, before we get started, I just want to remind everyone to please subscribe to the Batman vs. James Bond show on Spreaker and iTunes, and please leave a nice little review for me on there. Now, we are exactly less than one week till something called Awesome Con. Now, for all you listeners in the Maryland, D.C., Virginia area, you know exactly what this is. It's, you know, it's obviously the start of Comic-Con season. If it hasn't already started in your area, your neck of the woods. Now, Awesome Con is... I didn't realize this, that they have all different kinds of con names out there. They have Awesome Con. Of course, the biggest one is San Diego Comic Con. They have New York Comic Con. They have something in Philly that's, who knows what it's called. Maybe it's called Philly Con. I'm not exactly sure, but I'm going to one called Awesome Con this upcoming week. And I'm going on Sunday, as a matter of fact. So right before I'm, you know, getting ready to record the show in this last month or so, I've been trying to get my costume together because take a wild guess of what I'm going to be dressing up as. And yes, you guessed it. I'm going to be dressing up as Batman. Now, the problem is that my Batman costume, I, I have a couple different variations of the costume and I've put like, I'll put it all together in the last couple years. I have, you know, I'm going for the Batman Begins costume because like I said, that's probably my favorite out of all the costumes. Now I do have a gray Batman costume. It's kind of like one of those skin tight ones, if you will. And um, I I don't want to have to wear that because let's just say that, you know, my gut starts to show in that and I'm kind of, you know, as confident as I might sound on here, I'm not as confident when it comes to wearing that costume. So I'm trying to avoid wearing that. Um, We'll see what happens. Maybe my wife will dress as Wonder Woman or Catwoman. Yes, she does have both costumes, hence why I'm kind of married to her. But um, yeah, for any of you cosplayers out there, if you have any suggestions or if you ever have any cosplay or if you have any picks pictures from comic cons that you're going to um send them to me and i will post them on instagram i definitely want to share them out there because you know there's all different variations of the batman costume there's all different variations of the harley quinn costume now let me just say that i might be a slightly bigger fan of harley quinn right now just because their costumes anyway i'm losing my my train of thought now but um yes any kind of uh comic con batman related costume that you have out there that you'll be wearing to these comic cons please send them over to me at batman versus bond or email them to me at batman v james bond at gmail.com and i will post them for you anyway so let's get down to business um yeah as we always do in this part of the show we always start off with some news and 
the news has not been light this week, let me tell you. Um, there's been, you know, last time we left off, we were talking about the whole Daniel Craig update and um you know is he coming back to be james bond is he not going to be james bond for the next bond 25 film now at last we heard is that daniel craig turned down almost a hundred million dollars to to return for the next two films to be james bond Uh, that has still not been confirmed yet um everything i read says you know it's not official yet And that's how we're going to treat it. It hasn't been confirmed, and as I always say, until it's confirmed by a major site, until it's confirmed by the actor or, you know, by an agent, whatever, studio, then we're going to just treat it as a rumor. But this is a pretty big rumor, especially for you UK listeners out there. Um, Every other day, it seems like there's a new name that's popping up. There's some kind of story saying something about Daniel Craig. And, you know, we haven't heard anything and that's you know it kind of sucks because we're kind of at that standstill because now it's just going to be rumor has it whatever but we have heard some confirmation on some other stuff related to the next james bond film now let me start off with this um this was actually coming out of the hay festival of literature in wales this past saturday um it turns out the director sam mendez yes he's the director of skyfall inspector Probably two of my favorite James Bond movies. Now, I will, I've will. i always said Skyfall is probably right now one of the top highest James Bond films when it comes to the Daniel Craig era. Casino Royale is in a close second sometimes. It depends on when I watch those films. I did love Spectre. I really love Spectre. But it's not my favorite Daniel Craig James Bond film. And, you know, my reason for that, and um, I might as well get into that right before I start with the story, is just that when, uh, when a movie... How do I say this? When a director ends up coming into a, a movie and he, he sometimes they bring most of the time they bring in fresh ideas. We would like to think that they did. And that's exactly what Sam Mendes did. He he almost he didn't breathe not just new life into this, but he just kind of brought back some of the old classic elements. And that's what I loved about Skyfall. Um with Spectre, he did the same thing. That was more of a throwback, but at the same time, it I kind of felt like the uh, producers kind of said, hey, why don't you come back? Here's a, here's the truckload of money, as the saying goes, and we want you to direct this. And he treated it, it it's almost like he ran out of um, creativity. It's almost like he ran out of ideas. And I have nothing wrong with that. It's just that, you know, it, I and I don't want to say that he got lazy on it. I'm not saying that at any stretch of the means. Um, there was some really interesting stuff that he brought to the table with that. It's just that I can tell that, you know, the man's tired and, you know, the same could probably be said about Daniel Craig or any director who takes on a Bond movie or a Batman movie because a lot of work goes into this. How do you take a character that's, you know, we've seen on film and stories so many different times and how do you put your own like spin on that? I feel that Sam Mendes definitely did do that with the last two James Bonds. I just felt that he did it more in Skyfall and it was hard to compete. I think he just put out something so great that he couldn't top himself, so he kind of went in a slightly different direction. But, you know, definitely Sam Mendes is definitely one of the, will remain one of the top uh, directors of the James Bond film universe. Now, it has been confirmed by Mendes himself saying that Spectre is officially his, was his last James Bond film. Um, you know, he told the crowd it was an incredible adventure. I loved every second of it, but I think it's time for somebody else. And um, Mendez also stated that the decision is entirely up to producer Barbara Broccoli. Now, she is the daughter of the old franchise producer, Albert R. Broccoli. Um, as he quoted, it's not a democracy. It's not the X factor. It's not the EU referendum. It's not a public vote. Barbara Broccoli chooses who's going to be the next Bond. End of story. I can guarantee you whatever will happen with it, it will not be what you expect. That's what she's been brilliant at, and that's how it'll survive. Mendes says we should trust in her taste because the last time Broccoli chose an outside, out-of-the-box bond, things worked out very well. Public support for Daniel Craig was zero. It was her saying, that man over there is going to change the whole thing. I'm going to cast him. So, yeah, like I said, it's really sad to hear that Sam Mendes is not coming back. Honestly, I'm not quite surprised about this. Like I said, I think that Mendes has done everything that he possibly can for um, James Bond or that he wanted to do with James Bond. And, um, you know, he set a pretty high precedent for um, directors. And it's going to be quite a challenge to live up to that. A lot can be said about that with Martin Campbell and with Casino Royale, that he set such a high standard 
what a James Bond movie can be. You can have a James Bond, it's almost not so much about just action, it's about drama, it's about a character study. And I'm very interested to see what they're going to do with, you know, the next James Bond. The biggest question I have for you guys is, what direction should the producers and the writers go with the next James Bond? Should it be, you know, get away from the origin story, just make James Bond, kind of like introduce how they did with... Piers Brosnan, how with Timothy Dalton, how they did with even Roger Moore. It's just like, here's your James Bond, no backstory, you have to accept who it is, and that's it. Now, when it comes to the actor, we can go on forever and talk about this, but, you know, if it's not going to be one of the favorites, maybe Barbara Rockley is trying to pull another one on us saying, okay, you know, of course people would love, you know, Tom Hiddleston to play James Bond, you know, a lot of people want Tom Hardy, they want Idris Elba, whomever, but maybe she's thinking of an outside name. Maybe just, you know, once again, just saying, hey, this is not who you think. I know what I'm doing here. I've, you know, I've obviously had a lot of experience with this and I know what can draw a crowd. And, you know, I don't have to go. This isn't about just fan service. This is more about what who can carry on this franchise for the next 10 years even. And, you know, that's how it's going to be. So, like I said, tweet me. Let me know what you think. Who should be the next James Bond? What kind of direction do you think they should go in and so forth? Now, going back to directors, there's always speculation. All these websites always post, oh, this th- these are the top 10 directors who should direct the next James Bond movie and so forth. And the names, you know, there's a few names that change. There's a lot of names that end up staying the same. One was on this uh, website called Collider.com, one I frequently check. And they posted ones... Um, with some names that I will, will agree with and some that I'm not too sure about because I haven't seen any of their work. Now, I want to hear what you guys have to think about this, but I'm going to check off this list super quick. Um, one of the people that they put on there was Danny Boyle. He's best known for Slumdog Millionaire. He recently directed the movie Steve Jobs. Now, that had actually a Bond favorite in it, Michael Fassbender. Um, you know, and that's more of a character study kind of film. I didn't get a chance to see it. Um, Got to say, actually, I wasn't so much interested in. I think there's been enough of that, but you know, about the character of Steve Jobs. But um, I will say that you know, obviously, with you know, if you look back at a, a director like Sam Mendes and the kind of work that he's done, um, one of my favorites that's non James Bond related was American Beauty. And even when I saw that movie for the first time, and I love that movie, I would have never even thought of him to be a James Bond director, like you know, ten years or however many years from when that movie came out, and. This is the direction I think that sometimes the the producers of Eon Productions like to go with. It's let's pick somebody that, you know, maybe they don't have to be the best with action. We can make up for it. That's why you have a second unit director. We'll make that happen. But if you have somebody who can tell a good character story. Now, a lot of people always have mixed feelings about this film, Quantum of Solace. You had director Mark Foster. Now, he was best known for directing Monster's Ball, which is anything but a James Bond movie, even though it did have a Bond girl, Halle Berry. And he won her an Oscar in there. Now, that movie, it's, you know, he was more of a, you know, obviously a drama kind of director. And now he has become an action director. He directed something. It was the uh, World War Z film. And that's definitely action. That's zombie action. And for a director like that, I mean, once again, it's more about character study and just, you know, a character driven film. So it sounds like that's, you know, like I said, like I keep coming back to that it's all about characterization and not so much about action you have also on this list they mentioned christopher nolan now that is obviously a favorite um of mine i obviously because i'm a dark knight trilogy fanatic and i love those movies but i think realistically i don't think nolan's going to do it um even with what's going on with mgm studios now we haven't really talked about this too much it's well for those of you that are not in the know the james bond or not just james bond but James Bond is owned by MGM and many other movies out there. Now, the thing is that Sony had a contract with MGM and they were distributing together. And now that deal is finished. It ended with Spectre. Now, the question is, what's going to happen with James Bond? So MGM, you know, the rights for MGM are up to another studio. Could be Warner Brothers, could be Paramount, Universal, whomever. Now, let's just say they go over to Warner Brothers. Well, one of their top directors right now is not just Ben Affleck, but it is also Christopher Nolan. Christopher Nolan is pretty much the Clint Eastwood. He can be given whatever amount of money and he can direct whatever he wants. Now... Could I see Nolan directing a James Bond film? He's always probably, I think he's always wanted to, but 
I don't know. That's that's a pretty big name to do that. But I mean, I've heard crazier things before. Um, Nolan's definitely had Bond elements in all of his Batman movies, and you know, especially in the movie Inception, and uh, which is practically like a James Bond movie. And uh, definitely check that out. There's a lot of good scenes in there that are reminiscent of a James Bond movie. I'm not saying that he couldn't do it. I'm just saying that I don't think that he would want to commit to something so similar to what he did with Batman. I think that was almost like his James Bond in a way, more realistic. He had his Q in there, which was Morgan Freeman's Lucius Fox and with the gadgets in there, so and the car and the women. So I don't think he's going to do that. Um, other names that were on here that um, I was pretty interested in, Dennis Villeneuve, I can never pronounce this, Den- Dennis Villeneuve. Ben Leave. Um, he's the director of Prisoner, Sicario. Um, he's going to be directing the new Blade Runner sequel. Now, what I like about this guy is, like I said, um, I didn't get a chance to see Sicario, but I did see Prisoners. And, you know, once again, I'm going to keep using this character study. It's it just a great thriller suspense movie. And when I think of a Bond movie, I can definitely see somebody doing that. Um, you know, he can get the most out of his actors. And the director of photography that he's been working with in his last two films, including Sicario and the upcoming Blade Runner sequel, is Mr. Roger Deakins. Roger Deakins, for those of you that didn't know, he was the director of photography for Skyfall. That's half the reason, well, maybe a quarter of the reason why I love Skyfall so much. Just this, how those scenes were shot. Oh, my goodness. It, it was gorgeous. And, you know, I just, um, I'd love to see him come back to, you know, I know that he did everything that he possibly could with Skyfall. But, you know, if um, Villeneuve, Villeneuve comes uh, into direct, I could definitely see Deacons coming in with them, especially if they have that that relationship they've had in the last couple films. So anyway, as we move on here, just let me know what you think. Um, who would you like to see direct the next James Bond movie and why? Let me know. Tweet me at Batman vs. Bond. Now, going back to whether Daniel Craig is returning or he's not returning, honestly, nobody knows at this time. Um, some actors, actresses from the older James Bond movies have shared their input on this. The first one was Miss Judy Dench, who played M opposite Craig three times, Casino Royale, Quantum of Solace, and Skyfall. She quoted saying that she bottom line thinks that he needs a break. I think he is exhausted, absolutely exhausted. Uh, who do I see as the next James Bond? I don't really know. It has nothing to do with me. It is up to producers Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson. So, you know, there you have it. M, Judy Dench. Um, oh, my goodness. She is so great as M. And she's probably probably my favorite is to play M. Um, you know, it's once again, it's up to producers. Nobody knows. And, you know, we can we could file a petition for, say, Tom Hiddleston. We could fire, file a petition for Idris Elba to play James Bond. And you know what? I bet you they'd probably go the exact opposite direction. And why should they have to listen to us? It's not fan service, like I said. So there you have it. One more person, and uh, this is Sir Roger Moore. In an interview with the Daily Mail, former James Bond, Roger Moore commented saying, he's the incubate actor in the role until it, he says otherwise. However, having it reported that he's quitting could force producers to offer Craig a new contract, and by auditioning possible successors, they might nudge Craig into signing for his fifth Bond outing. So, you know, and there you have it also, an actor who's played James Bond, you know, actually he's played James Bond the most amount of times, and, you know, he even says it's actually, up, it's either up to the actor or it's up to the producers. So I think, you know, we just can we are at a standstill at this point. Now, something interesting also I found was that, you know, of course, you know, there's a lot of people out there who, you know, want to see a different kind of James Bond movie. The interesting one was that an article was put in the Washington Post that, you know, no woman shouldn't play James Bond. And let me, it, it all came out because an actress um, from the X-Files TV show slash movies, Jillian Anderson, saying that, you know, she wanted to play James Bond. And instead of playing, you know, the actual character James Bond, she wanted to play somebody called Jane Bond. Now, I will say this, that, you know, I, I guess I'm old school, I guess, you know, whatever you want to call me, it's that, you know, James Bond is James Bond. He is a man. He is always going to be a man. If you want to have like a spinoff, like it's been talked about before long ago, which was when all the way back in Die Another Day in 2002, when they wanted to do a spinoff for Holly Berry because he was she was such a big name at the time. And she was like kind of the equivalent or they tried to make her the equivalent of James Bond. And. I'm sorry, it's not it's not going to work. It's not possible. James Bond is 
he is a British spy. You know, if you want to, you know, have him ha- have, you know, Scottish roots, if you want to have him have Irish roots, whatever. And, you know, if you want to make him, you know, Caucasian, if you want to have him be African American, if you want to have him be Hispanic, I don't see any problem with that. But I still stand saying that James Bond should always be a man. You can always have different iterations of the character, but. Until otherwise said, you know, oh, it should always be a man. So let me know what you think about that, ladies. I'm sorry if I've offended you, but those are just my thoughts. Anyway, moving in. All right, now moving on here, let's shift gears a little bit. For you Batman fans out there, oh boy, do I have some news for you guys. Um, Starting off small here, and actually this isn't so small, um... There's been some more shifting around, if you will, at the studio, like with producers and executive producers. Now, a lot of you might not know this name. Um, His name is Charles Roven. He has actually been a producer for the Dark Knight trilogy. He's been a producer for Man of Steel. He was a producer on Batman v Superman. But no longer will he be a producer. He will now be moved to executive producer. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means that he's, as Variety put it, he's taking a bit of a step back from the DC Comics film slate. Um, he opted to remove himself from the day-to-day overseeing a various comic book movies and development. Instead, he's just going to make sure the film stay on schedule and within the budget. Now, this is really um, fascinating to me only because... Okay, about a week ago, we reported that Jeff Johns is going to be the new head of DC Films, and now you have more shifting around with the whole producers, the writers, the directors. Now you you have Ben Affleck as an executive producer. You have, you know, all these different hands in the cookie jar now, and is this a response to how Batman v Superman was received? Was it because of, you know, it wasn't received as well as the studio wanted? It's beginning to seem a lot that way. And, you know, Batman v Superman, you know, obviously it hasn't reached the numbers that, you know, everybody had wanted, at least in the studio's perspective. For the fans, we always say this, there's fans that love the movie, there's fans that were in between like myself, and there's fans that just did not like this movie. And, I mean, you know, you don't have to be a diehard Batman fan to, you know, say that you didn't like this movie. You don't have to be a diehard fan to say, hey, well, you know, this was a different, this was different than what I expected. And the way it seems like Warner Brothers is saying, you know, or how we can take this is that Warner Brothers is responding to you know, how it was received and all right, it's time we make some changes because this is our this is our meat and potatoes. This is our bread and butter right here. Our studio it's almost like the fate of their studio, at least with the comic book movies, is it rests on Justice League and it rests on Suicide Squad, Wonder Woman, and you know, if they don't get these next films right, then I hate saying it, but it's almost okay. Well, time for a reboot, you know, because it just wasn't working quite the way that they had planned. So, and if that's how it happens, that's how it happens. I'm, of course, rooting. I want to see a good Justice League movie. I want to see all the cool characters up there. I want to see, you know, I want to see Suicide Squad be the game changer. I really do. I think we are just under 70 days at the time of the recording. I believe it's almost 65 days by the time you listen to this. And I think Suicide Squad's probably going to be a good, it's going to be a good change up for Warner Brothers. And it might not be what, you know, they wanted Batman v Superman to be. But I think that it's because all, it's a different, it's a fresh perspective. You have nothing but villains in there. You have your main, probably your top tier um, superhero, Batman. Sorry, Superman fans out there. But you have Batman making more than a cameo. In there, um, like I said, there's a rumor, not so much rumor, it's um, kind of a spoiler, if you will, saying, you know, Batman, you know, who Batman's going to confront in there. I posted it, but I'm not going to talk about it because just like you guys, I don't want a spoiler. I don't want to know anything more than I have to know in there. So anyway, that's what we have there. Now, the next bit of news here, and this is for you Batman fans, This you might like this, you might not like it. I know where I fall on this. Um, it has been confirmed by Jesse Eisenberg that Lex Luthor, or that he will be returning as Lex Luthor in the Justice League movie. Now, I have my feelings about this, like I said, and it's pretty simple is that, you know, I, Lex, I mean, Jesse Eisenberg tried too hard with this role. I think he, you know, he was actually supposed to be cast as, um, Jimmy Olsen, and instead he ended up getting the Lex Luthor part. Now, I gotta be honest, 
I wasn't so much a fan of Jesse Eisenberg as Lex Luthor, and I'm not even a Jesse Eisenberg fan to begin with. So, I mean, he played pretty much the identical same part that he did in Social Network as Mark Zuckerberg. Um, you know, it's like he tried too hard, and it just, I, I just didn't like it. It was like a combination of Heath Ledger's The Joker meets The Riddler from Batman Forever. And I know I'm not the first one to say that, but that's really what it ended up being. And he was he was almost too off psychotic, if you will. He was just too much kind of quirky, and I, I just didn't care for it. And I'm not saying that you can't change. I was almost hoping that they were going to change, you know, who played Lex Luthor because he wasn't even supposed to really play Lex Luthor. He was supposed to play Jimmy Olsen. Um I just, uh, I don't know, and I, maybe he can, you know, it's not that he can't act, it's just I don't think he was right for the role. I think there is, that, this is a whole other debate, but I think that a whole bunch of different actors could have played that part, and I just, uh, I don't know, I'm not too excited about this, but um, maybe he will, you know, take some of the criticism, you know, and he can kind of improve on his Lex Luthor. We'll see. Now, this final story here is about Jeremy Irons. Now, Jeremy Irons played... Alfred in Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. He's going to be returning as Alfred in Justice League, and he's also supposed to be playing Alfred in... So the final story I have for you guys this week is that Jeremy Irons, he played Alfred in Batman v Superman. He's supposed to be returning in Justice League, and he's supposed to be playing Alfred once again in the standalone Batman movie directed by Ben Affleck. Now, he had some interesting comments to say, um, to say the least. Um, he was quoted when he was talking with the Daily Mail saying that Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice deserved its bad reviews. Quote saying, deservedly so. I mean, it took 800 million pounds, so the kicking didn't matter, but it was sort of overstuffed. It was very muddled. I think the next one will be simpler. The script is certainly a lot smaller. It's more linear. How about that? For one of your main actors to say, hey, this movie just, uh, it was overstuffed. It just, there was too much going on. Now, I do know a guy, he does a podcast. And it's called Batman versus Super, I mean, Batman versus James Bond show. It's found on Spreaker and iTunes. Ding. Um, he made that same comment. And, uh, you know, I'm not obviously the first person to make that, but for an actor, for your Alfred in your movie to actually say that, that's pretty ballsy. It's especially when you're getting a paycheck from the studio, but you still, you know, and the movie just didn't come out, what, a couple months ago, not even. So, hey, you know, Jeremy Irons is a well-credited actor. Um, to my knowledge, he is an Oscar winner. Not that that makes him any better than any other actor out there. It just means that, you know, he is, he, he's been awarded. So, he, and he's gotten, he's got some honors. And, you know, it doesn't take, you know, a rocket scientist to say, hey, you know, there's, Batman v Superman did, you know, didn't do what it possibly could have. And, you know, maybe it, you know, like I said, maybe you liked it, maybe you didn't like it. But nevertheless, for an actor, you know, to say this about a movie that just came out a couple months ago, it's not the first time an actor, an actors have said that before, saying, hey, this just wasn't what it uh, we could it could have been or whatever. But, you know, hey, got to keep moving on. So anyway, now moving on here, there are a lot of birthdays. And um, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna be able to spend a lot of time on them this week, because there are that many. But I do want to mention them really quick. Um, the first one I want to mention is Christopher Lee. He played Francisco Scaramanga in The Man with the Golden Gun. He celebrated a birthday on May 27th. The next big one is Ian Fleming. He celebrated a birthday on May 28th, the same date as my mom's birthday. Happy birthday, mom. Um, he is best known, if you did not know, as being the creator and author of the James Bond character and creating all those books out there. And if it weren't for him, then we wouldn't have James Bond as a character in general and all the movies and whatever else is out there. So a big happy birthday to you, sir. Uh, Gladys Knight also celebrated a birthday. She did the song or the theme song for License to Kill. She celebrated a birthday on May 28th. Danny Elfman, composer of Batman and Batman Returns movies. He celebrated a birthday on May 29th. Probably one of my favorite scores to this day. Um, Sheriff J.W. Pepter. Clifton James, who played Sheriff J.W. Pepper in Live and Let Die and The Man with the Golden Gun. He celebrated a birthday on May 29th. Actor Jonathan Price will be celebrating a birthday on June 1st. He was Elliot Carver in Tomorrow Never Dies. He played a great villain in there. Morgan Freeman, Mr. Lucius Fox, celebrates a birthday on June 1st. 
And last but not least, Marvin Hamlish, who did the score for The Spy Who Loved Me celebrates a birthday on June 2nd. Happy birthday to all of you. All right, now on to the next segment called Versus. This is the part of the show where we compare movies of the Batman and or James Bond universes versus other franchises in the same wheelhouse. This week's Versus is Batman Begins versus Iron Man. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Let the DC versus Marvel fanboys come out for this one. So let's start with Batman Begins. Now, going all the way back to 2005, I know that's been over 10 years from now. And, well, it was a time where, you know, we just came off Batman and Robin probably however many years earlier. And, you know, Batman is obviously such a beloved character, not just by me, but by a lot of people out there. And we haven't seen such a good Batman movie, some will say, since either Batman Returns or even Batman Forever, um, depending on which one you do like better. So what do you do? You Give it to an indie director, you give it to a guy named Christopher Nolan, a nobody at the time, um, best known for directing Memento, but then you make an actor who was just coming off, or a kind of a new, an actor who, he people knew who he was, but not as many people, you know, they knew his face, but they didn't know the name, and I'm talking about Christian Bale. Now, he was in a movie previously called American Psycho, and great great movie if you want to see batman go um go dark darker than any possible he was like oh my god i can't, I can't even get into that because it's i almost want to go watch that movie and then i want to go back back and watch batman begins but um going in the wrong direction here anyway it, this guy has such great acting talent and you know he might not be your typical um choice for a batman actor but who is so and then you have a whole a great supporting cast you have michael kane you throw in morgan freeman in there you throw in liam neeson and you throw in gary oldman in there and you have yourself one rebooted batman franchise and a lot of people weren't taking it seriously at the time it's like okay well it's batman and you know it's like what is the what 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 do we expect out of this what 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 can we, you know, what can we see that we haven't seen in any other Batman movie? Well, you see an origin story, and that has never been done before. And you know, this almost started the whole oh re- reboot origin story of you know whatever superhero, and let's tell the backstory and how they became this character. And you know, a lot of people can argue this with me, but and I can argue it right back. Batman Begins still stands to this day to be one of the greatest origin stories of not just Batman, but of any other superhero character out there. And we'll get into Iron Man in a minute, don't worry. But, you know, it was interesting, you know, have a backstory about Batman. We all know that how his parents died. Yes, Martha. I know I said it. And we know how his parents died in the alley, but what happened after that? It's always been, okay, let's just jump, you know, it's just been a quick flashback. But in this case, it's, you know, we see young Bruce and we see him have to live with, you know, dealing with his parents' death, and we see a younger Alfred, uh, Michael Caine, you know, still showing him a little younger, and we see him, you know, in college, he comes back, and he wants vengeance, and he he can't get through the pain of losing his parents, he wants to go after the people who did this, but, you know, physically, he can't yet. Mentally, you know, he technically can't either, because he's just a kid who's just watched his parents get murdered, and he's kind of scarred for life with this, and he just... You know, how how does a child or how does a man deal with that? And instead of taking vengeance, he just, you know, he decides to just, you know, get out of Gotham City and he decides to go, you know, he ends up trying to figure out the criminal mind. And for you comic book fans, I think that you can agree that that's exactly what, you know, certain interpretations of Batman have done is they've tried to see, you know, how can Bruce Wayne, you know, get the idea of what a criminal was thinking? Well, he decides to kind of like go off to, you know, whatever countries and try, you know, he doesn't really become a criminal, but he kind of understands what's going on with criminals. And in the same way, he's lost and he doesn't know which direction, you know, what path to take. And that's when he ends up being caught and thrown in prison. And that's when Henry Ducard ends up finding him and tries to get him to join the League of Shadows. And, you know, I don't want to go back into it too much, but Fast forward here, he joins the League of Shadows, he realizes League of Shadows is not a good organization, not quite the boy band that he should be joining, and instead of, you know, just vengeance, he wants to go back to Gotham, and he wants to help clean up the streets, he wants to, you know, not just get the guys who are behind, you know, his family, his parents being murdered, he wants to also, you know, um, stand for true justice, he wants to be a symbol, and, you know, he gets back, he does this, he uses his father's, um, 
well, he uses Wayne Enterprises as more of, you know, okay, my cover is Bruce Wayne. That's, you know, technically that's my mask. But in reality, I've turned into this vigilante known as Batman and because I'm scared of bats and as he should be when you fall however many feet into a cave and are attacked by bats. And, you know, he creates, you would see the creation of the bat suit, which we've never seen before. We see the creation of the bat cave. We see creation of the Batmobile. And at the same time, you know, it's just like, okay, well, this is a Batman learning to become, you know, who he really is. And, you know, at the same time, he's going to fall. He's, you know, why do we fall? So we learn to pick ourselves back up. A saying that I still stand true to this day. Actually, I have it in my cubicle, so I don't forget that. Um, such a great quote. Um, you see, you know, it's just a realistic tone. It's just, what if Batman re- existed in this world? And the backdrop is Chicago. And, you know, we might know it, or some people might know it. Oh, that's Chicago. Clearly, it's not Gotham City. But what if Gotham City was a real city? What if this really was a place in the world? And what if Batman really existed? He doesn't have superpowers. He just has these gadgets and he has this suit and he's doing the best he can. And, you know, it doesn't just end up being, you no, know, just a great Batman film, but it just ends up being such a great origin story and just a character study. And that, yeah, obviously I've keep, I, that obviously that's the theme of tonight, character studies, but this is definitely one that can stand true to that. So that's Batman Begins. So fast forward three years later, then you have it, something called the Marvel Cinematic Universe that's being created. And on a character who's known, but not quite as known as, say, Batman. Um, you know, Marvel fans, you can argue with that. Me also send your hate mail at batmanvjamesbond at gmail.com. Anyway, um, Iron Man is who I'm talking about here. And Iron Man is... Iron Man is a character that I definitely can say, you know, can be very comparable to Batman and Bruce Wayne. You know, same idea. Um, you have a character named Tony Stark. He's, you know, he's... his Both his parents have passed... Um, his father, you know, was, you created something called Stark Industries. They create weapons and, you know, Tony's kind of like this rich kid who's very intelligent as Bruce Wayne is. And Tony ends up going over into the Middle East. He's selling his weapons. And then all of a sudden he ends up getting captured. And then he realizes what his weapons have done, um, you know, because of, you know, a, a missile, one of his weapons exploding, it, the shrapnel got caught in his chest and he's living pretty much on a battery. And that's how he gets, like, the actual chest symbol there, um, the arc reactor. And, you know, then all of a sudden after he escapes, you know, Tony comes back and says, hey, you know what? I don't want to sell weapons anymore. I, I have an idea that if I, this suit, I can put a better spin on it. And I think I want to protect the people that I put in harm's way. And that's exactly what he does. He creates a couple Iron Man suits. And we see a creation, once again, of a superhero and it, with this take, at least at the very beginning of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I really liked it because, you know, we could definitely see an actor or just not an actor, a character such as Tony Stark living in the everyday world. And I, I don't they didn't borrow that, I guess maybe they did from the DC Universe. But at the same time, it was just like, OK, well, that's kind of he's kind of like a Batman in a way, because he doesn't have superpowers, but he does have a suit, and his suit can be a, make him a superhero. At the same time, he's just this rich guy, and, you know, he's caught up in something far beyond what he could possibly imagine, but he's trying to do the right thing. So when we put Batman versus Iron Man, it's not a question of, you know, who's the better character? I always say that. It's more, you know, the similarities that they have. Obviously, both movies were origin stories. They don't have any superpowers. Um, The differences are that, you know, of course, the universes that they live in, um, you know, there's aliens that exist in the Iron Man universe, which they end up getting into later on. But if you're comparing it just Batman Begins versus Iron Man, I can definitely see a lot more similarities than differences in here. Um, Iron Man was more, you know, there's more jokes in there, and that's what Marvel's known for, and I enjoy that. With Batman Begins, this is more of a serious take. And, you know, you obviously see to a kid you know, watching his parents get murdered. And Iron Man, you don't quite see that, but, you know, you still know in the back, okay, well, what happened with Tony's parents? We don't get that backstory, but, you know, um, really thought that was, you know, an interesting uh, versus just because, you know, the 
a lot of times, especially on social media, you always see, you know, the comparisons, who's better, Iron Man, Batman, who would win in a fight, Tony Stark or Bruce Wayne? Well, honestly, I think they're more alike than, you know, a lot of people do think. And I, I don't, I don't know if one's better than the other. I am fans of both. I mean, obviously I'm the bigger Batman fan, but I do respect Tony Stark. I do respect the Iron Man character. And, um, you know, if it came to a fight, well, you know, Batman does have an armored suit as we did see in Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. And that's because of the Frank Miller, um, whether the armored suit in Iron Man came first, I don't know. That's I, I'd love to know. Um, you know, if any of my um, you know, tip my listeners out there, um, uh, if you can let me know, um, which armored suit came first, which character came first, Iron Man or Batman? I believe it was Batman. So we can technically say that Batman came up with the iron suit. I don't really know, but if you were to put them in a fight, I think Batman. I don't know. See, that's a good one. I don't know. I mean, you can't use Kryptonite on Iron Man, so. I don't know. But, um, you know, let me know what you think about these two movies. Um, are they similar? At least to me, they are. Um, you know, the characters in general. Is Tony Stark a lot like Bruce Wayne? Is Bruce Wayne a lot like Tony Stark? Is Batman a lot like Iron Man? And so forth. I mean, I think Batman, you know, like I said, he doesn't have, you know, he has the technology. He can have the gadgets in there. But I think it's the driving force of what makes Batman Batman. It's all about being, you know, it's all about vengeance. It's about being vigilante and he's kind of like um you know he will you know push the criminals to the edge to the point where you know he won't kill iron man will kill now, now there's a good point before i forget iron man will kill batman technically doesn't at least in if we're talking about the dark knight trilogy of the nolan universe that batman didn't kill maybe we'll get that to that one part in dark knight in another time but for this matter iron man had no problem killing you know as he did in the middle east and batman he didn't never killed so there's another difference between the two so let me know what you think tweet me at batman versus bond send me a message whatever you want to do let me know what you think but that's your verses for the week now on to the final segment of this week the matchup of the week in this segment i will take two different characters from the batman and james bond movie universes and you guys will decide who will win last week's matchup was dr crane scarecrow versus le Chief. now ugh. Wow, we we talked about this a little bit, and I put it out there. Didn't get too much feedback. I'm waiting on that feedback, kids. You know who you are. Um, you know, a few votes did end up saying that Scarecrow would be the clear winner. Lashiv never stood a chance. I will say once again, if it wasn't for the nerve toxins, then you know Lashiv might win. But honestly, I think that when it comes to you know the more evil side, I think Doctor Crane, you know, has his techniques as Scarecrow. I think he can cause a lot more damage than Lashif. Lashif is more kind of like a second, third tier villain. He's not quite like a you know, a Scarecrow. Not even to the um, not even like a number two um, like in Thunderball. I think he's just kind of like, well, I'm a money man. I'm an accountant, but you know, and I can you know tie you up to a chair naked and scratch your balls. But that's about the extent of it. So I'm going to call it right now. Scarecrow, Doctor Crane is the clear winner in that. Now this week's matchup is going to be. From Tomorrow Never Dies, and he was just celebrating his birthday, Jonathan Price, who played Elliot Carver, and it was the, um, who was the head of Carver, the Carver Media, and who was the head of Carver Media Network, or Carver Media Group, I believe it was, versus Daggett from The Dark Knight Rises. Daggett is, was the businessman who was kind of bankrolling Bane, and kind of like, he owned the construction company, he worked at Wayne Enterprises, and he was, he was a real shady kind of business guy. And I thought this was really a good matchup just because, so you have two villains and are they the most, um, they're obviously not all about muscles. They're not the most genius, but they are about kind of like power. They're not like quite after world domination, but at the same time, well, maybe Carver is a little bit about world domination when it comes to, you know, uh, viewers and so forth. And, you know, capitalizing on his media group, Carver would definitely be have the upper edge. He had the muscle in there. He had his Mr. Stamper um, Daggett. Well, Daggett kind of had Bane. Daggett was kind of, I think, honestly, Daggett was more of a peon in The Dark Knight Rises. It was more like instead of him using Bane to achieve what he wanted to, which was, you know, becoming the new head of Wayne Enterprises, it was more Bane using him without his knowledge. 
So, and it didn't end up really good for Daggett at the very end of that. Now, I want to know what you guys think. Who would end up winning in a fight? Elliot Carver versus Daggett minus the henchman. Who would win? I think Elliot Carver might have the upper hand. I don't think Daggett has it in him um, to just, you know, pull the trigger. I think he's all talk. Elliot Carver at least will, you know, as we saw in Tomorrow Never Dies, he's willing to get a gun out there. He's willing to shoot one of his um, scientists, technical guys. And, you know, I think he's a little bit more cold-blooded. He doesn't matter. It doesn't matter for him who gets in his way. He's willing to kill his wife. Daggett, he's just like, oh, well, you know, I'm going to send my henchmen and they can kill Selena Kyle. And, you know, I think I can get control Bane, but at the end, Bane's going to double cross me. So, yeah. So that's your matchup of the week. I will post that on Twitter and let me know who you think will win. So, that about wraps it up for this episode of the Batman vs. James Bond show. Once again, please subscribe on iTunes and or Spreaker. Let me know how I'm doing. Make sure that you rate this show and please leave me a nice little comment. I would appreciate it. Uh, follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Batman vs. Bond and like me on the Batman vs. James Bond Facebook page. If you're interested in being a guest on the show, please direct message me and we can set something up. Once again, I will be at Awesome Con this upcoming weekend. If you're going to be there on Sunday, let me know. Um, you might see a guy dressed up as Batman there um, handing out some business cards with the Batman versus James Bond show. Um, let me know and um, we can meet up there. So like James Bond, I will return. Thank you for listening as always, and until next time, peace out. Have a great week, everybody. Bye-bye.